The Chosen Season 3, Episode 3 has obviously been one of the most intense and amazing episodes that we've seen so far. And of course, that all culminates in the synagogue scene, which we're going to break down today. There's so many little details and hidden little things that have to do with culture or history or biblical accuracy that are really done well in this scene. There's a ton to talk about here, but first let's break down the synagogue, exactly what it looks like and why it's ordered in the way that it is. Essentially, a synagogue, especially during the time of Jesus, would be a simple room and especially in Nazareth as well. Pretty small, rectangular in shape and would house certain specific things. One being the scrolls that they would read from, the law, of course. They would have seats around each side of the synagogue, and then there would be one seat in particular in the back middle of the room. And then in the center of the room, there would be a podium or an area where you would read the scriptures. Now, contrary to popular belief, women were actually allowed to attend these services and to learn the scriptures. This is an important part of Jewish culture as they wanted women to learn what the scriptures said as well so that they could follow God to the best of their ability. However, they were not permitted to sit with their husbands or to sit with any other men. So they were separated by sides of the room. One side would be females, one side would be males. We see this portrayed in the episode itself as we see all of the women on one side and all the men on the other. This is actually one of the reasons why Paul later on asks the women not to speak up during the service because while well, they'd be screaming across asking their husbands to clarify things for them or to ask certain questions during the middle of service distracting everybody. If the woman was sitting directly next to her husband and could whisper to him, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But in this case, obviously it would have been very distracting. Now in this scene of the chosen, we see as there's an attendant who brings in a scroll and this would have been very common as well. Someone would have been in charge of bringing in the scrolls for the day for the reading that was prepared ahead of time. And this would have been kept in a specific area. Now in modern day, they would call this an ark. It's kind of like a surrogate for the Ark of the Covenant where they hold the law, where they hold the scrolls. I'm not sure if that would have been the same during this time, but it's a similar kind of area where they would keep the scrolls and it would be very important to them, obviously. We'll talk about some of these other synagogue elements as we continue through this scene, but let's talk about some of the characters that we meet throughout this episode as well. Of course, we have Dinah and Rafi, who we met during season one, episode five. They were the parents of the groom in that episode, and of course, really good friends with Jesus and his family. Then we see Rabbi Benjamin and his wife, Leah. These are obviously leaders in the community, Rabbi Benjamin being the preeminent rabbi in this area. And we don't really see any other Pharisees that are attendant, at least in this synagogue, but we do see them in the Rosh Hashanah scene back during the festival. Then we meet some of Jesus's childhood friends, obviously Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, but we also meet someone named Aaron. While Aaron isn't a biblical character, he may hold significance for this scene in particular. The scene really begins with Rabbi Benjamin coming out and beginning a prayer for the service. Now, the beginning of this prayer is the Shechech Hienu, which is actually a prayer that they say at the beginning of the Jewish New Year. It's basically the first prayer you're supposed to say at the New Year. And obviously, this is that time. But then he continues into the prayer asking for forgiveness and redemption, but also asking that the Messiah would come. I love the look that Jesus gives during this little part of the prayer. And once the rabbi is done praying, he asks Jesus bar Joseph to come and give the reading interpretation. And of course, this is the Jesus that we know, but bar Joseph means son of Joseph. One interesting thing that Rabbi Benjamin says here is that they've heard many reports of Jesus's antics and his miracles and different things, and some of them were positive. This kind of shows that Rabbi Benjamin doesn't have a very good outlook as to who Jesus is overall, or at least the path that he's taking right now. As Jesus steps up to the reading place, he's actually given a scroll. This is extremely important because remember, Jesus doesn't pick this scripture. He doesn't pick this passage. All he's given is the scroll of Isaiah, and then he finds the passage that he's supposed to read. This is a very common practice within synagogues. They would have been reading through specific sections. Just like we see in synagogues today, they read through the Torah over and over and over and over. They don't skip around and teach random bits and pieces, kind of like we do in Christian churches today. It's more of a linear sort of progression through what they want to teach. And as he's given the scroll of Isaiah, he begins to read a very small passage. In our terms, it wouldn't even be two verses long. Now, while they had no chapters or verses in the scroll of Isaiah, we know this as Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 2a. He doesn't even finish the entire verse 2. He stops before it's done. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to the opening of the prison for those who are bound, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we've seen many references to this scripture throughout all of the chosen. Obviously, it's a very important scripture for the messiahship of Jesus. We saw this back in season one with the children and even as recently as episode one of season three. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Isaiah. Isaiah. The prophecies of Isaiah. He has been sent to proclaim liberty to the captives, and what? The opening of the prison to those who are bound. Yes. This prison is nothing now that he is here. Now the next step in the synagogue after the reading is to sit down and to give an interpretation. But there is a little bit of an important piece here that I think is really interesting to talk about. And that is the seat in which Jesus sits. Real quick before we continue, I want to let you guys know that we're going to Israel in 2023. I have some amazing, amazing videos planned and I'm so excited about the trip overall. It's going to be awesome. But you actually have the chance to come with us in 2024. The goal for us is to go every single year. So if you want to go to Israel, then this is the year to go. I tried to make this trip as cheap as I possibly could, and it's going to be an amazing, amazing trip. If you have any questions, let me know or contact us in the email that's in the description down below. Anyway, I hope I can see you on that trip and let's continue with the video. Now within the synagogue, there would have been different types of seats depending on who you are or what you're doing. So there are general seats for anybody that wants to come in and see and listen. Then there are chief seats for kind of important people or people that have done something amazing in the community. And then there is a Moses seat. Now we only know this term because Jesus tells us it in Matthew 23. He mentions that this is called the Moses seat. And this is where the leaders of the law or the rabbis or the Pharisees would have given their interpretation of what they've just read from the scriptures. Now, this is a very cool moment as Jesus sits and he begins to teach the rest of Nazareth, but there's actually an interesting thing I wanna talk about with the chair as well. Now, I don't know if the chosen did this on purpose or if it's just a cool design of a chair, but to me, it looks like Moses himself holding up his arms in the desert. Now, this could be totally wrong and chosen give me clarification in the comments below if you'd like to do that. But I think that this may have been purposeful. Having the Moses seat kind of be a depiction of Moses would make a lot of sense. And this would even strengthen Jesus's position as the Messiah, right? A lot of the Jews saw Moses as this Messiah-like figure, like he is the biggest and best of all the Jews. And yet Jesus is sitting in his seat, telling everybody that he is the one that's gonna save them. He's the one that's gonna bring them out of spiritual debt and to bring them into freedom, this year of Jubilee. Doing all of that from the position of Moses would have been a very heavy thing for this community. Not sure if I'm 100% right on that one, but it is an interesting thing to think about. After Jesus sits down in the Moses seat, he begins to share his interpretation of what he's just read. And of course, this is extremely important. He begins by saying the scripture that I just read is being fulfilled today. This is the year of Jubilee. This is a year of redemption. And at first it seems like everybody is really enjoying what he has to say, that this is gonna be a year of Jubilee, that it's gonna be a fulfillment of scripture. That's amazing. And then Lazarus speaks up and says, not bad for a carpenter's son, right? And then we get this weird moment with Rafi kind of making a jab at Joseph. I mean, especially Joseph. Now I wonder if this is a jab specifically at Joseph not being a very good carpenter or builder because he specifically chose woodworking as his profession instead of being a stonemason or kind of incorporating all of it. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know exactly what this is for, but it definitely adds tension to the scene. And then Rabbi Benjamin basically calls out Jesus, asking why he didn't continue with this passage and speak about the day of vengeance, especially since in today's world, they're so persecuted. And of course they could use God's vengeance at any time. Remember, this is pointing back to the Messiah. This is pointing back to who they thought Jesus was going to be. They thought that the Messiah was going to come as a conquering king a warrior, a military leader, to come and destroy the enemies of Israel. And yet the Messiah was sitting right in front of them, explaining to them that that was not the case, at least not yet. Jesus specifically says that the day of vengeance is in the future. And of course, we haven't experienced that yet either. Jesus is going to come back. And when he does, it will not be as a soft lamb, a meek man, 
but as king. Now, up to this point, everybody is kind of having a nice discussion and they kind of like what Jesus is saying. But here's where things change entirely. As Jesus puts himself into the scripture, as Jesus makes himself kind of the pinpoint of the fulfillment of the scripture here. I'm not here for vengeance. I'm here for salvation. You're here for salvation. What are you saying? This is where Jesus essentially declares that he's the Messiah without actually saying it. And Jesus begins to explain here that the year of Jubilee that he's talking about is not a forgiveness of financial debt, but of spiritual debt. And this really riles up the whole synagogue because, well, as seeds of Abraham, they truly believe that they don't have spiritual debt, that they are the good people. They are the protagonists in the story, right? And everybody else that's around them, the Romans and the people that have been attacking them, are the people that need a forgiveness because they are not people of God. So let's talk about this year of Jubilee for a second. What is this? Well, back during a certain time of Israel's growth, they had this concept called the year of Jubilee. And every seven years, basically forgiveness of debts and slaves would be freed and a bunch of other stuff would happen. Basically, everything would go back to its rightful owner. It was basically a big reset, helping everybody to level the playing field again and to make everything right again so that debts would no longer be owed and slaves would no longer be slaves. It was, it was a time of forgiveness. And so Jesus is saying that this year, this time, this era is another year of jubilee now i don't think that he means a physical year i think what he means is the coming of the messiah has you know come he's here and now is the time when the messiah can do what he's supposed to do but the problem here is that the jews don't want to accept that they even need a year of jubilee they don't want to accept that they have any debts at all and not financial debts but spiritual debts and this is a pretty big deal it was the chosen seed of abraham we don't have spiritual debt. They're not accepting what Jesus is saying, and they're not accepting him because they know him. For example, you treat me much differently than my mother or my friends do from back home because you experience me through a camera. You experience me through a online portal into YouTube, right? So you don't really know me as a person. You didn't grow up with me. You don't know how intelligent I am or my true personality or what I'm like when I get angry or tired or upset. You see a little tiny glimpse of who I am through the online portal of YouTube. But the rest of my family and my friends, they know who I am. They know my flaws and my weaknesses, right? And so they can look at me on YouTube and say, hey, he's got great success. But at the same time, they know who I am and they're not impressed by it. So for me, I understand this on a very small level. But for Jesus, it must have been exponentially bigger. We get a ton of scripture in this scene, which I love. And then the moments interspersed in between really help to connect those moments throughout the scripture. We get the moment where Jesus says, surely you'll quote to me the proverb which says, physician, heal yourself. Nazareth would have expected him to come and to do what he's done in other places here in his hometown. But that's not why he was here. He's not here to give them a physical healing or to forgive their physical debts. He's here to do something better, much better and they just don't understand it. This portion of scripture is probably my favorite from this scene overall, where Jesus really gets into a logical debate here. You guys know very well that I'm a logical person and I love kind of walking through these things little bit by little bit. The true prophet from Adonai would not deny his own people's signs and wonders. Listen carefully. When a great famine hit Israel during the days of Elijah, Three years and six months, there were many widows, yes? And we know how the Father cares for his chosen people, especially widows. But Elijah was sent to none of them, not a one. Now, Jesus here is using their arguments against them. He knows that they're thinking, why isn't he healing here? Why isn't he doing what he's done in other places here in his hometown? So then he goes into these two examples of Elijah and Elisha using them to kind of prove his point. And of course, these are two of the most prominent prophets of all of the Torah. These would have been people that absolutely everybody in that room would have recognized and known the authority of. And Jesus isn't just saying opinions about them. He's using direct scripture to talk about them, using the very scriptures that they've built their lives on in order to show them this point. And yet they still don't listen because they're stuck on the fact that, well, Jesus can't be. He can't be the Messiah. We know him. 
We grew up with him. But then Jesus begins to plead with them. He's trying to save them with all that he has. And this comes to one of my favorite lines that has ever been spoken in The Chosen. If you do not realize that you need a year of the Lord's favor, then I cannot save you. If you do not realize that you need a year of the Lord's favor, then I cannot save you. The year of Jubilee is an image of God's grace and his mercy for us. The fact that Jesus came, that he died on a cross for our sins, that's him taking away our debt and giving us a new life. This line doesn't just appeal to the people in Nazareth during that time. It appeals to us as well. If we don't realize that we need a year of the Lord's favor, then we're gonna think that we're good enough. We're gonna think that we're fine. Just because you grew up in church your whole entire life, just because you think that you followed all the rules, it's not good enough. We can't be good enough. That's why we need Jesus in the first place. Then we see as Rabbi Benjamin comes up and he says, are you claiming to be a prophet or the Messiah? And Jesus says, yes, meaning both. Now I love seeing the reactions to everybody during this moment. Rabbi Benjamin is kind of like flabbergasted by this. Everybody else is kind of getting angry, but then we see specific reactions that are actually really interesting. First, we see Dinah as she's looking over at Mary, looking to see if Mary knows, looking to see how much Mary is on board with this, looking to see how she's reacting to this whole situation. She's not looking at anybody else. She's not looking at Rabbi Benjamin. She's not looking at her husband for clarification. She's just focused on Mother Mary. Then of course we see as Leah is beginning to freak out, of course the rumors that she's heard from her friend Hannah are now becoming true, and she's beginning to see that everything that she's heard is actually the truth. That the humble Jesus she knows is claiming to be the Messiah, even though she could never comprehend that before. We also see Lazarus and Mary of Bethany as Mary is excited. You can see the joy and excitement on her face as she's listening to Jesus claim to be the Messiah. She was waiting for it the whole time. Then as the scene continues, we see as Jesus begins to whisper in Lazarus's ear, giving him instructions, telling him it's going to be okay. We can infer from this that he's telling him, hey, I'm going to be okay. I need you to tell my mom that I'm going to be okay. And I need you to pack a bag for me because I won't be staying here. Oh, and also meet me at my father's tomb. And the final nail in the coffin for the people of Nazareth is Rabbi Benjamin coming up and saying, if you do not renounce your words, we're gonna have to follow the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. Now, of course, this controversial line, we've talked about a bunch, so you can check out our other videos on that. But this does make a ton of sense for Jesus' role in this scene in particular. We see him sit in the seat of Moses, claiming to be the Messiah greater than Moses. And now he's saying that he is the law of Moses. All of this is sort of connected. And again, breaking down this idea that the Jews have of Moses, that they see that Moses is the best Jew of everybody, right? But now Jesus is claiming to be higher than him. Of course, this would mess with their whole ideal of what they think is truth. Earlier on in this passage, Rabbi Benjamin actually quotes Deuteronomy 18.20, which is interesting because it, they don't follow what comes after 18.20 in 21 and 22. Rabbi Benjamin begins here. It's a book of Moses. But a prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak. That same prophet shall die. But then he doesn't continue with the passage, which says this. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now, obviously, Jesus did not speak presumptuously here, but the people of Nazareth didn't even wait to see if the prophecy that he's saying would come true. They just immediately judged him, not following the law, even though claiming to follow the law. So these actions they're taking against Jesus are actually less about following the law than it is following their own feelings and understanding of the situation. So this is when we see everyone grab Jesus, take off his talit, and begin to escort him outside. Now again, adding to our Moses case, we also see as Rafi is on one side, but Aaron is on the other. Obviously, the prominent brother of Moses that held up his hands in the desert. And yet Aaron is holding down his hands and bringing him to a cliff. Again, I'm not sure if that was an intentional choice by the writers, but it is interesting. Now let's talk about the music during this section. This is one of my favorite scores that they've done so far. 
Now, I think this is an Arabic oud. That's an instrument that kind of looks like a guitar. It's kind of pear-shaped, and it has a big, round, bulbous back. It's almost like a small Arabic guitar, but it's very distorted. Now, this could just be a normal guitar that has a specific tone to it to make it sound more Middle Eastern and more this way, but it does sound a lot like an Arabic oud to me. I just love the simplicity of this track, especially at the beginning. It feels very empty and yet chaotic and full, like a tornado or a swirling wind. Everything just seems to be going all over the place, and they intentionally took out any of the background noise, not hearing Mary scream or anybody yell or talk to Jesus. It all just kind of drowns out. It's chaotic and interesting. I love the way that they did this. Then we see, just like in scripture, they take Jesus to the precipice, and their plan is to throw him off the cliff. And if that doesn't kill him, most likely they'll throw stones down after him to kill him. This is a pretty serious thing. And in scripture, they were ready to do this. They were going to do this. And in scripture, we don't really get any dialogue at all. But here, Rabbi Benjamin asks him one more time to denounce his words so that they don't have to do this. He's almost begging him to get out of this. They don't want to do this. Once Jesus makes it clear that he's not denouncing his words, then Rabbi Benjamin gives the signal for Rafi and Aaron to give him the push off the cliff. Jesus steps up right as Rafi and Aaron begin to move, and he looks directly in Rafi's face. Very intimidating, for sure. And he says, Rafi, Aaron, Rabbi Benjamin, this is not going to happen not today. Now this line, not today, is obviously alluding towards his crucifixion later on, that he will die and he will die for them as well. But that time is not today. He's got a few more years of ministry to do and a lot of stuff to get done in between now and then. After saying this, Jesus just walks through the crowd. Not only does he walk through the crowd, but they all split to allow him to go through. Maybe another symbolism of the Red Sea splitting for Moses. I don't know if there's that many symbolism moments in here, but it could be for sure. Now in scripture, there is some sort of signifier that this is a supernatural event. It kind of alludes towards that a little bit. And we see that Jesus does this at multiple different occasions. When people are trying to kill him or when they're looking for him, he just seems to up and disappear or walk through them without being noticed. Now, if you look here, I think the Chosen in particular made this a supernatural event pretty specifically because you can see that nobody is even looking at Jesus. It's as if they're all forced to look forward and can't look back. They were obviously given specific instructions as actors not to look at Jesus as he passes through. If this wasn't a supernatural event, you'd definitely see as the nosy Karens of the village would be looking at him, snarking and saying different things as he passes through. But I would count this as another miracle that the father has saved him from this moment. And at the end of this moment, we actually see as Jesus smiles, which is interesting. When I first watched this episode, I thought that that was him crying, that he was sad about the situation, but it's almost as if he looks up at the father and smiles. It's an interesting moment for sure, but I wonder what the writers were actually thinking here. Was this Jesus's like triumphal moment with the father or was this something else? There is so much to this scene. So if I missed anything, please let me know in the comments below. I did a much longer kind of breakdown in our live stream that you can check out on our Patreon. So if you want full access to all of our live streams, then you can go over to our Patreon and sign up for any of the tiers, $5, $10, or $25 a month. That really helps us to continue this ministry here. Anyway, we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.